thank you, thank you very much. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, but we've still got about 20 minutes or so to have a good discussion now. Um, so I think what might be a good idea, I've, I've got a very difficult question I'd like to ask all of you to kick off, and then perhaps if we can open it to the floor. We're also joined by Paul Drew, who's here representing the interests of the residents, uh, and I believe there are some more residents in the room as well, which is, which is great. Um, so I'm going to ask my very awkward question. Then I, I might pass the mic over to Paul if you have any commentary you'd like to add from the day. And then if we can just open the floor to questions uh, from everybody. So my very difficult question is, if you could change one thing, looking back with 10 years hindsight, what would each of you do differently? Or is it perfect? Discuss. It's perfect. Okay. Um, well, I think probably uh, one of the things that is uh, hardest in this sort of scheme is integrating the affordable component. And um, I, mean, I think there's some very good things that happened here in terms of um, uh, when, when it was built. It was built early in the process. Um, but inevitably, because the brief for the uh, market housing was for you know relatively expensive housing, um, there was going to be a difference between the affordable housing and the market housing. And um, you know, in an ideal world, it would probably be slightly better integrated. I don't think it's bad, and I think there is some interesting research that's been done that suggests that it, in in comparison with some other developments, it's actually quite a positive way of dealing with. Um, that connection between the affordable and the, and the market housing. Um, but I guess, uh, well, we, I suppose one thing we would have liked to have done would have been to have uh, been retained uh, on the later phases and, and actually, and, and for the affordable housing as well. Because I think there are, some, there are some subtle differences in the detailing that, you know, they, they kind of matter to architects, but I think they probably matter in reality as well. So I think missing out on some of the detailed design work uh, for some of the buildings was a, was a was a, a disappointment. We did offer our services to, to the to the second developer. Um, they said they didn't need us because it was already they already had a model to build from. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's like, I think that's probably the, the main thing. Two things. Sorry. Well, pretty much exactly the same thing. I think it, um, in a way. Um, it's so often thought that the architects have sort of finished their design work when you get planning permission, and you. But you know, it's the building's only half designed by the time you uh, get planning permission. There's all the detailing to come, and I think uh, I suppose when I come back, the the bits that the sort of the countryside phase that was completed and that we, you know, working for the contractor did all the detailing for. All those whilst every now and then I see one or two things that are compromises. It's pretty, um, you know, incredible, and actually I'm really proud of what was achieved. I think I am disappointed that that level wasn't achieved on the affordable housing, and on the on the later phases because they were then detailed by other people. And it, you know, superficially, you know, it's used as the same brick, and so uh, you know, a lot of people won't see much difference. But it, you know, it's about the the way the railings are detailed, or exactly where in the wall the window is those sort of things that are, act, actually are the, the sort of care with which something's designed. And I think they are very important. And I, I mean, one of the things now in London that um, the mayor of London is recognizing in the new London plan is this design continuity issue that actually so often there's a, a loss in quality. You know, actually, what's been amazing since Accordia in the last 10 years is how everywhere, you, you know, planning authorities are really becoming aware of what they should expect and demand and the standards that can be achieved. But actually, and, that, and that's being achieved on paper, but it's actually seeing through that through to the, the finished articles really, really important. Because it's, it's not uncommon as happened here that, you know, one developer gets the planning permission, then it gets sold on and someone else delivers it and all of these things happen. And in a way, the, we need to have a system where the, um, the planning permission can protect some of those things. 
well, at risk of repeating ourselves, I'm going to say the same thing. Um, I, I think, uh, as I explained to my group when I was walking around, one of the key reasons for the outcome of phase one, at least, is the fact that the architects were retained under the innovator to the main contractor under the design build contract. Um, unfortunately, the third of our buildings was um, sold on, the plans were changed, and it, it wasn't delivered, you know, in the way that we would have delivered it, and the, in fact, the internal plan changes were such that the elevation treatment didn't really make sense anymore, so that is a real shame. Um, so, yeah, I was explaining again to my group that in, more recently, we've, at least when that process has happened, we've been retained by the client as a guardian, um, and our recent projects that you might have some projects published in London. A number of them are actually delivered by other architects where we are retained as a guardian. And that process um, can lead to very successful outcomes. Um, I don't know whether that, what, that was around at the time or it certainly wasn't offered to us as an option. So I think had we had the opportunity, I agree, we would love to have delivered our buildings all the way through. I think for me, I, I still regret the fact that we didn't get that extra link road um, through to Shaftesbury Road um, to connect a quarter in much more with the street pattern of the surrounding streets. Um, and I think as we walk around, I talk to someone, they're saying, well, actually, it's people coming out of Shaftesbury Road in the evenings, a lot of traffic coming out of Brooklyn's Avenue, and people might rat run through um, a quarter if they had that link road. But I think maybe you could make it one way so people couldn't actually rat run out, they could maybe drive through, which they wouldn't particularly want to do. I just think there needs to be, it would have been nicer to have had a stronger psychological connection between Accordia and its and its neighbors. Um, and I think also that that could have been a place where one would have put the shop, because the shop that for about a year existed on the bottom of that, two, three years, but wasn't really viable because there wasn't enough footfall. If one had actually designed a sort of an, inter, uh, some intermediate space between Shaftesbury Road and Accordia, which could have attracted passing footfall from the offices and from the other housing schemes. Kaleidoscope is a pretty grim housing scheme on the other side of, of um, uh, Shaftesbury Road that has no facilities. It might have just taken off. And, and similarly with the offices, I mean, I think inevitably, because they're government offices, they've got this high security fence around it. And it's a bit of a shame in a way that the offices are so completely separate from the residential that everything is very much zoned into, into its own use. Um, and I know some people kind of quite like that because it's sort of tidy, but it just seems to me that, again, if one's doing it again now, one might have tried to get a little bit more interaction between the people who are working in that area and the people that are living. Um, but I think there might have been different views about that. Well, I'm probably the odd one in the pile. Um, thank you for selling me my house. Um, it's um, the, you know, residents, Everybody who lives in the house has the opportunity to interrogate it, and it happens on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So the community that has been there probably have the most research evidence you could possibly need to know whether it works or not. And um, generally, everything is working very well. And it's, um, I believe, amazingly robust, and the houses are good, and I appreciate all of the design effort that's gone into what I might call loose fit because a lot of the spaces are slightly more generous than um, in a typical house so putting somewhere you know it's that classic one that Jonathan tells me about which is the bikes bins and uh, cars get that right and a lot of the rest fits so all of that from my point of view seems to work there um, if I had a negative about it um, it really is post-occupation and the relationship to the authority. Um, the the authority had were gifted um, an amazing landscape and an amazing scheme. The landscape from 100 years earlier, almost like a arboretum landscape. Um, and the fact that it was adopted and became part of their 
cost regime to manage, um, it's been very difficult for the community to um, get the authority to live up to that expectation and care for that environment. So although it looks great today because it's rained on it, um, the, the regime for management of it um, has been a bit, a bit wayward. It took, I think one of the bits of uh, data that was missing from the closure of you guys leaving was, um, I think there's a landscape management plan but only in draft. I think it took till 2013 to embed itself. Um, and even that, they don't quite meet, you know, they don't cut the grass as much as they should or replace trees, etc. cetera. Um, and, and I think there's a legacy of trees and landscape there that um, I think the authority have to get up to the game with if they're going to keep it. I think Countryside put in uh, a terrific landscape at the beginning, which I think you guys always have done. Um, it was handing over the baton, and um, it, I think it's really important that the authority do, do uh, take that responsibility seriously. Thank you. That's an interesting point about the landscape. Um, I remember we had a talk and tour of Aura last year, and there were some similar comments made about how um, the landscaping there has been kind of quite carefully designed. And then again, when it comes to being handed over to the local authority, it's almost as a, a step missing in whether it's through educating the authority on how they then manage it, or perhaps how there's a, a handover process to them. Um, so maybe that's something we could all think about in the future. I don't know. Um, I'd like to I'd like to cast the net wider and see if there's any questions from anyone in the audience um, for our heavyweight panel we've got here. Um, uh, I'm going to oh, see a hand there. Hi, hello. I'm Zev, I'm a member of the CAA. Um, thank you so much for coming and spending your time with us and explaining about the great scheme. Um, the question maybe starts with um, uh, admitting that we are privileged uh, to have this prestigious scheme done by great architects, good, we'd call it enlightened developers, um, a modern uh, uh, new scheme which when you're trying to compare it to the rest of the country, which I know that things are moving ahead, but um, you look at the mass house builders and that's kind of the, the, the issue that I'm trying to get to. How we still see masses of housing built cheaply, uh, squalid, tiny spaces, uh, cheap quality, which after 10 years would fail. You'd have, you know, uh, leaks, uh, roads uh, are falling apart. But how, how can we take this legacy, uh, Jonathan, that you're talking about and pass it on to the wider uh, market? Um, how, do, how can you? take lessons and pass them on, lessons of quality and lessons of, of, of say, generosity. It's an interesting question because there are so many different constituent parts of various bodies involved in housing development and, and the creation of any place around the country. So you've got highways, authorities, local communities, um, national bodies, local bodies. It, the list goes on. And everybody has a different agenda. And I, th I think in Cambridge particularly, we've been really quite lucky in that we've had a very enlightened local authority who recognized um, development has a value, and particularly in Peter's day. I think perhaps one of the boldest moves was actually it's got to be an architecture with a capital A, I think was mentioned uh, at some point. And, and that was very much impressed upon us, and, and some of our competitors as well, actually, in the area. Um, you then have an enlightened urban design team, an enlightened landscape architect of the city council. Um, you have a very enlightened highways authority, and I don't think I've ever come across a uh, highways authority quite like Cambridgeshire Highways. Um, and the development management guys there are fantastic. They, they really want to see quality and they want to learn from what they've done. Um, you just don't get that in other local authorities. You get, here's the book, you get officers who are disinterested. And I know on things like open space management, we were just talking about, 
you go to all the troubles of your landscape architect produces the landscape management and maintenance plan and it goes to local authority it's part of the planning application and gets approved then you go for the well, actually we'd like to hand you the open space right now and the officer goes well my planting regime is this and i'm going to cut the grass once a month and and it just goes into a list of i've got 150 different open spaces and that's what i'm doing and you're like well you wanted this document to help you manage yeah but we're not interested in that we're never going to read it so i think it, it comes down to a, a desire from local authorities, bodies, stakeholders in, in the design process to actually take ownership of some of these schemes, some of these great aspects, and also for them to be funded well. And, and quite a few local authorities have said, well, developers don't give us any money, or developers are a bit tight. Or it's not really the case in my experience. Most developers will quite happily pay sensible community sums. Um, there's always a discussion around it. But local authorities get an immense amount of council tax from new development. There's the new homes bonus. They get an immense amount of new homes bonus coming from central government for providing housing. And yet, where does it go? It doesn't seem to go on the places that the pe where people live. It sort of disappears into the ether. So I think funding of things like landscape management, funding of officer resource, and, and certainly um, Cambridge is one of the better resource local authorities. So I think that's how we start to get that legacy is proper funding, education, and, and people taking ownership and responsibility, and, and that goes for developers too, because obviously there are some um, poorer competitors than we, than ourselves. The, the, I guess the reality here is that you know Cambridge is a very affluent place. We're, we're, we're you know an hour away from less than an hour away from Kings Cross, um, and so you know you can't necessarily apply some of the good things I think in this scheme everywhere, unless there's another way of. Um, uh, of, of building, you know, economically, you know, it's, it's a problem. It's a fundamental problem, and um, uh, and to a certain extent, you know, on this development, the space standards weren't an issue uh, that, that we weren't building to the minima. And uh, you know, I think when you do get to other locations where the demand is different, there is a, there is, uh, I think, a place for better space standards. And the London Housing Design Guide was a kind of start, perhaps. And was you know useful in some ways, um, but it does come down to uh, to money in the end. Uh, but it is one of the things that I think dis that uh, differentiates this um, uh, that there is space to, to live, you know. And if you are going to build family accommodation, places for people to live in, particularly um, you know with the lifetime homes sort of an, um, hat on, uh, you do need something that, as Paul said, is sort of slightly loose fit where there is space have stuff to put stuff to, to use um, and it's a problem it's a problem with all housing developments uh, where, where uh, in, in particular in parts of the country where maybe the market isn't quite as strong as it is in Cambridge that isn't an answer it's just stating the problem but you know I don't know what the answer is I, I think because we, we obviously when we completed the scheme we were showing it to lots of people and it, I mean Cambridge as a location is a real exception because of, you know, the um, it's one of the wealthier parts of the country. So that makes things possible here that might not be possible elsewhere. I think also there's a lot of unique qualities of the site, having this existing mature landscape, being very close to the city center, being five minutes from the train station that connects you to London. All of those things were a, a sort of very fortuitous set of circumstances. I think also, you know, the the quality of these big family houses, which is a lot of why they're very special, is also partly down to the fact that the original outline permission, which had a lot of much smaller houses in it, absolutely limited the number of homes. And so, uh, in a way, if, if that hadn't been the case, there might have been pressure to try and put more units on the site. But because that wasn't possible, and that was, you know, came down to traffic and all sorts of things, there was seen to be a value in this market in making bigger homes. But if it had been possible to have more smaller homes, I suspect that might have been the choice. But there wasn't that choice within the planning permission. And I think there, there are certain sort of, you know, accidents of history, as it were. I mean, obviously, it's a very deliberate decision in planning terms, because it's the capacity of the roads. But I think it's one of the things that has meant that you've got a lot of these very, you know, quite large, generous family homes, which might not have happened in a 
another situation. I mean, you know, because we've argued for them in other situations, it's been much more difficult than it was uh, uh, in in uh, this uh, particular situation. Um, I mean, one of our follow-on projects from Accordia was New Hall B, which is in Harlow, which is quite opposite to Cambridge. Um, extremely low costs, low you know, value at the end of the day. They were, I think, less than around 200,000 pounds, the houses, um, all timber frame. And we did actually apply some of the, albeit they're they have this Essex Barn vernacular. They are back-to-back -back courtyard houses with courtyards and elevated living spaces. And there were two things that allowed us to do that. One was the landowner was um, basically two guys who were developing their family farm. Um, and they had the foresight to appoint um, um, Roger Evans Associates as master planners to put together a master plan for the whole site which included um, materials, things like floor-to-ceiling heights, space standards, some idea about how the blocks would be made up. But I think, I hope that it is possible that you know you can have this kind of development all over the country. Because the feedback that since we were shortlisted for the sterling price for that project, the feedback we got from the homeowners is that there aren't any homes like that for people to buy. So most of the people who lived there lived in London in a flat, were looking to move out, and tried to, well thought, okay, I can't afford Cambridge. And they found those online. And then they, there were very, very few sort of home counties, modern, contemporary developments. Um, and people who wouldn't normally have gone to live in Harlow went to live in Harlow because they were, there was no other offer. Um, so I would hope it's possible, but I think the design code really, really helped. And it, you know, arguably, when you go there, it is a bit of a zoo because it's too. There's too many materials in that design code, in a way, and it's it's gone way too far away from the accordion model of the sort of background of brick, you know, limited palette. Um, so there's probably lessons you could learn from both, but I would, you know, that project kind of proves that it's possible. I think. Too much. I let a lot of people ask questions, but I just think that I mean, at the heart of this is this kind of really <coughs> sort of inefficient way in which we deliver housing in this country, uh, where uh, we make house building so difficult and land is so scarce that inevitably it just falls in the hands of a relatively small number of very large house builders um, who have profited enormously from the um, shortage over the last three years. I think one hears about Tony Pidgeley um, at um, Chris Nicholson, is it, who's just given himself 135 million or something. Uh, at a time when you know, there's a housing crisis in the country. So the, the, the market works very well for the volume house builders. It doesn't work terribly well for people, for particularly people who want affordable housing. Um, and it's difficult to know how we're going to break into that. And I think one of the ways that people are talking about more, although whether there's going to be any government support for that, is that there needs to be a much more aggressive approach from uh, the public sector and that local authorities need to take a much more assertive line in uh, promoting and then uh, uh, master planning and developing these large sites in a similar way to they do in Germany and, and Holland, where in particular the German system where quite often it is the local authority who owns the land, who does the master planning, who does the, put in a lot of the infrastructure, and then a lot of the actual building is just done by self-built groups. And so you've got a much richer variety of building than you do through the sort of standard. And it's those sort of ideas which I think need to be pushed a lot harder. Um, I, but I do think that even within the confines of the clunky system that we are stuck with at the moment in the UK, more can be done, and I think more is being done because there are good examples to point to. The government actually, I was at a seminar this morning in London uh, where we were talking with the North Essex garden communities uh, people. Um, I think there's a countryside in the garden community there. This is around Colchester and Braintree. Um, they were having a, a workshop uh, talking about setting up a design review panel, and they had uh, at the seminar there was Andy von, Andy von Bradsky, who maybe people know, who um, was PRP, uh, he was the chairman of PRP, a very good housing architect. He's now working full-time in the ministry um, on as the government's housing design champion. And he's actually got a small team of people now working in the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, specifically looking at, at, at promoting good housing design. 
And there's some quite good stuff in the latest national planning policy framework about design as well. So he was kind of quite bullish about the extent to which that there was much, I mean, it's rather ironic, you know, with this government having the kind of person who's able to abolish CABE and also all lots of organizations are already there to promote good design, but they're suddenly realizing that actually government does have a role in promoting good design. And that message has to get across to local authorities, that local authorities, if they employ good people, if they set up good design review panels, and if they, if, if they you know, take, t take their courage in their hands and, and refuse crap on the basis that it was crap, hopefully now, with the government we've got, that planning inspectors will back up local authorities, and house builders will, will learn that if they're going to get permission, they need to appoint decent architects, and they need to keep those architects on board right the way through to, to conclusion. Because there's a very good little bit in the MPPF. So they've picked up this point about the value engineering that goes on at the back end of the process. And there's a specific paragraph in the MPPF now that alerts planning authority to need to, to be vigilant to the value engineering that goes on on the back end. And, and planning authorities need to have the courage to use that wording to, to be tough on house builders. Uh, it's, it's, it's sad in a way because it means it's more confrontation between planners and house builders, but that's just the way of the world, the, the, the way the thing's set up. But, you know, I, I, I came away from this morning feeling quite positive. Wait, wait, Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, okay, so I, you know, the, the plan of Accordia and what it's done to people and how they behave there, perhaps, is a good question to ask. Um, it, it did seem surprising when we first moved in, we saw us and other people choosing uh, not a typical model, which was a tiny space that's outside because we'd all jointly shared in the collective wider space. So people picked up behavior patterns where they went outside into the shared space. And there's been many occasions where um, if you were traditionally minded in wanting your back garden and going into that environment, it was a kind of new territory for you. So um, a lot of neighbors were surprised when there were events outside that were collective. And there have been many events over the years since we've been there actually from 2007 I think was the first event we actually had a community planning event to work out how to spend some 106 money and we put up some boards <coughs> on the on the hoardings of the building site to work out what to do and one of the great ideas that came out of it was to uh, rekindle Peter's idea for a connection across the brook so people could walk the corridor that is still ongoing. We, we got our permission three or four years ago. We got grant funding for it. Um, there's still a few legal wranglings to go through, but the community have been very strong in pushing that forward and sharing their own internal tensions about it. So some people wanted a protected enclave and other people wanted to be outward going. And that democratic debate has been very dynamic in Accordia. It's been extraordinary. Um, other events that have taken place, mostly things on the green. Um, the greens in the summer are a little bit like how people populate a beach, I would suspect, where if it's sunny, you go out and you find the bit that's got a space and that's where you have your picnic. Um, the organized events through uh, the Residents Association have been very good. Um, every year there's two, there's a Christmas one and a, a summer one. Um, the summer ones have been very interesting, or that the, the best ones were around 2013 up to 15, where there was either a, a band in a marquee. Uh, the most left field one was a cycle powered cinema, which was amazing. Um, all the equipment required eight dynamos to go, and it meant that eight people in the audience had to cycle perpetually to watch the film. <laughs> It was 150 people in the audience. They brought out their own deck chairs and pillows and bottles of wine and whatever. And uh, the peddlers, it was really quite hard. If you were failing, you had to put your hand up and somebody else would hop on. So, you know, there's been a lot of kind of innovative things of that nature. Um, started to decline lately, and I think it probably will pick up again now that other issues have got out of the way. One of the big ones, again, was in the original brief, which was um, it was a good idea to have a residence parking scheme. Um, after fighting for it since we moved in 2006, 7, and 8, 
uh, last month it was adopted and is operational. So the uh, propensity for commuters to come in and dump their car in Accordia and use the rest of the city has declined quite a lot and the place is becoming more civilized because of that. And indeed that was a, a another democratic debate in its own right. A lot of people saying, I want three cars, I'm going to put them there. Against neighbors who are saying, you know, can't you have one car, put it in the garage. So um, that's been very live and interesting to be part of, if slightly stressful. <laughs> The double yellow lines were important in a way. Yeah, the, the double yellow lines happened because um, it was a little exercise of mine, actually. I, I know hire engineers, and I showed them the scheme in plan, and I said, I've covered it in cars. Can we get a, a, a blue light through there, an emergency vehicle? And they said, no. So we took out cars until you could get an emergency vehicle through, and that piece of data went to the authority, and they very quickly had their own a big red light go on at that time and decided to um, yellow line the corners to make emergency vehicles come through. One little anecdote for that, um, a child had her first appendix in the year 2010 and had to be trolleyed down the length of the street because of people parking on the corners. Um, shared surfaces are an interesting psychology. Shared surfaces are an interesting psychology. Well, thank you very much. I'm very sorry to say we're actually out of time. Um, the bar is going to open in a couple of minutes, I believe. Uh, so if you want to stay around and ask any questions um, of anybody here, if, if you guys are able to stay for even just five, ten minutes, uh, uh, then perhaps we can continue the discussion. But I'd, I'd just like to thank everybody on the panel for giving up their afternoon to be here today. It's been an absolutely fantastic afternoon. I've learned an awful lot despite having lived just up the road for the past five years. Um, I'd also once again like to thank Taylor Maxwell and Traditional Brick and Stone for their support of the day. Uh, and thanks to Louise and the team at RIBA East for helping with organization. So a round of applause for our excellent speakers, one and all.